Hey, I just want to acknowledge that the last couple of months we have tackled some pretty heavy topics here at Time of Grace. We talked about abuse and we talked about abortion because these are relevant issues that don't always get the time that they deserve. We hope that you were able to take away some good, practical, godly takeaways. If you missed it, go back and check out those episodes. And we just want you to know that we really appreciate you hanging in there and listening, learning, and we appreciate all your support. Hello and welcome to Little Things with Amber L.B. Swenson. Today's episode is called Week on Purpose. We're going to talk about when we fall into the habit of being weak spiritually, weak physically, and when we're, we're not even trying anymore. And sometimes we're even proud about not trying. We say things like, oh, I've been so lazy lately, but I don't care. Or I know I should do this, but I'm not going to. Hey, it's Amber L.B. Swenson, wife, mother, worrier, overthinker, type A, holding on to God and his promises to get me through the day. Thanks for joining me to explore everyday issues from a biblical perspective so we can all know and love God more. I'm going to give you three reasons to stop doing that and to get motivated to do something different. So first of all, I think um, it's easy for us to fall into laziness, to being gluttonous, um, to using our phones way too much, to even doing sins like um, gossiping or telling what we consider to be small white lies. Um, Those are really dangerous habits to fall into. And I think they are habits. A lot of times if we get away with one lie, then we're prone to doing it again. Um, We can fall into saying what people want to hear. So instead of saying the truth, it's easier. Let's face it, it's way easier to just say what they want to hear. And um, that way we're not confrontational. That way they like us. But that's not the best. And that's not God's way at all. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to read to you a portion, a small portion, just three verses from the Apostle Paul's letter to Titus. And I want you to see that this is nothing new, this idea of people being lazy and liars and, and gluttonous and that type of thing. But look at Paul's language and how he confronted it. He said, for there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. The saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. Look at Paul's words, rebellious people, meaningless talk, must be silenced, disrupting, dishonest. Those are not good qualities, but they're powerful words, right? And we need to remember that as we fall into laziness, that can be rebellion. As we fall into gluttonous behavior, Uh, It's complacency as we gossip and tell lies and do things that we ought not to do. We shouldn't look at that as if that is no big deal. We need to see that as sin and as um, something that is pulling us away from that beautiful relationship that God wants to have with us. We have to remember that we are in a war. Our earthly pilgrimage is a journey. Every single day we start new. And some days, if we're honest, we rock it. We read our Bible. We're listening to worship music. Our prayer life is full. All throughout the day, we're in this constant conversation with God. And we, you know, as things come up, we immediately go to God in prayer. But there are plenty of other days, right? Other days where 
you let other things get in the way of reading the Bible. You push it back. Oh, I'll do it after lunch. And then you start doing something else and you say, well, it's not that big of a deal. I read my Bible yesterday. So, you know, it's okay. I'll just skip it today. Well, there's a problem. Satan doesn't take days off. That's reason number one, that this is a dangerous habit to get into. His army is constantly at war with us. We are told that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion. Do you think a lion is more likely to pounce on the strong or the weak? Do you think a lion would rather go uh, uh, after a baby or an injured or an elderly animal? Or do you think they would just as soon have this massive fight with the largest animal of the herd? I'm thinking they would prefer the easy kill. If we are weak on purpose... We are setting ourselves to be Satan's prey. He will pounce on us and take every opportunity he can to destroy our faith. And haven't you found that? I just had a situation very recently where, you know, we were going along really well as a family. And we were really enjoying each other's company and things were running smooth. And all of a sudden, woof! It's like the rug was pulled right out from underneath us. And all of a sudden, several of my children were in these situations that just were out of control. And my husband and I all of a sudden weren't seeing eye to eye. And and I thought, wow, what is going on? And I think, wait a second, Amber, have you been praying for your marriage? Have you been praying for your children spiritually? Because, you know, when it's going smoothly, That's when so often we take a break from those prayers. You're still praying, but you don't remember to pray for your your children spiritually. You forget to pray for your marriage. And and man, when you do, when you take a break from that, um, you're just setting yourself up to be pounced on by Satan. So number one reason why we do not want to be weak on purpose is because Satan doesn't take a break. And Satan isn't losing power. The way that Satan loses power is when we are spiritually strong. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How are we going to resist the devil? How did Jesus resist the devil? He resisted the devil with the word of God. When we are in the word, then we can use the word to resist the devil. We can use that word to encourage ourselves and to guide us when we're in situations that are spinning out of control. So we have to be in the word and we have to be in communication with our heavenly father who is our source of strength and who will come to our rescue. So many of the Psalms um, are just that prayers for rescue. Come to me, Lord, deliver me, help me. And so we can't take a break from being in the word and being in prayer. Number two reason that we do not want to be weak on purpose is because we rarely recognize when we are falling spiritually. The band, uh, the contemporary Christian uh, band, Casting Crowns, had a song called Slow Fade. And they talked about this, how, you know, usually you just don't one day decide to wake up and not be a Christian anymore. It's a slow fade. It's spending less time with the Lord and more time in the world. And... um getting pulled into worldly things little by little. Just it takes a bigger portion of your life, inch by inch, not, you know, yard by yard, but inch by inch. This is slow fade into unbelief. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, 
I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Maybe you're a little shocked by that last phrase. What? The Apostle Paul disqualified? You've got to be kidding. Listen, it can happen to anyone. We can all fall into spiritual lethargy. And if we fall asleep, we may end up like those five foolish virgins in Jesus' parable who thought they had faith only to find out it had been snuffed out. And they were suddenly at a point when they were relying on it for their eternal salvation and it was gone. They were left out. You know, a lot of people believe that if you've been baptized and if you know that Jesus is your Savior, you are good. You can just go off and live however you want and not worry about it because you've taken care of the, the things that you needed to take care of. You've checked your boxes. Baptized, check. I know Jesus is my Savior, check. Guess what? Even Satan knows all about Jesus. Satan knows that Jesus died for the sins of the world. That doesn't make Satan a Christian. Christians are those who believe and take up their cross and follow Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything that we do to earn our salvation, so please don't misunderstand. I am saying, though, The difference between the wise and the foolish virgins in Jesus' parable is that five of the virgins continued to fuel their lamps. They were prepared. They continued to grow their faith. They continued to stay in the word. They were not pulled away. They didn't use all their faith up, their oil up. And then just um, decide they were going to coast the last little bit. The ones who, who tried to coast, they, they were left out of the kingdom. We don't want to assume that we're, you know, we've got this all under control spiritually. We know who our Savior is. We're good. So there's no reason for us to be in church. There's no reason for us to read our Bible. There's no reason for us to pray. In fact, We're just going to be like the rest of the world. We do not know when our faith is snuffed out. It just happens in that slow fade, and that's the danger. In 2 Chronicles 24, we're told about Joash, and it's really a very sad, sad story. I'm going to read just a little bit about Joash's life. We're told Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. His mother's name was Zibia, and she was from Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada chose two wives for him, and he had sons and daughters. Now Jehoiada was old and full of years, and he died at the age of 130. He was buried with the kings in the city of David because of the good he had done in Israel for God in his temple. After the death of Jehoiada, the officials in Judah came and paid homage to the king, and he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and worshipped Asherah poles and idols. Because of their guilt, God's anger came on Judah and Jerusalem. Although the Lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him, and though they testified against him, they would not listen. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper because you have forsaken the Lord. He has forsaken you. But they plotted against him, and by order of the king, They stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. King Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father Jehoiada had shown him, but killed his son, who said as he lay dying, May the Lord see this and call you to account. What we would find if we continued reading is that Joash continued in his unbelief and eventually was killed by his own cabinet. 
just such a sad, sad account of how as long as the right people were leading Joash, as long as Jehoiada the priest was there, Joash did what was right. But this unbelief was in his heart and it drug him away. He easily fell into the way of the world just as soon as Jehoiada wasn't there to stop him. And that's a good warning for us to just be very careful and not take our faith for granted and not think that we have checked all of our boxes and so we are good. We're just going to live now and we're going to live for our own pleasure. Um, no, no, we, we need to be fueling our faith. And God, by the way, is so happy to do that. It isn't as if we have to do something wonderful in order for God to come to us and fuel our faith. No, he is there. The word is there, easily accessible. God meets us in his word, and he's going to give us that that guidance and the encouragement. He's going to build our faith. He's going to make us strong to withstand everything that Satan would throw our way. So, you know, we, we have no good excuse for why we can't stay in the word. And number three reason why we don't want to be weak on purpose is because we are the body of Christ and we have work to do. So both both in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul tells us that we're a body. And because we're a a body, we each have a different task. We each have a different role in the kingdom. And we have things that only we are designed to do. So God did not design me to do the same things that he designed you to do. He was so gracious to give us people of varied gifts so that we all have a purpose. And when we're all doing our part, the body works very well together. In the parable of the talents, which Jesus told, that's recorded in Matthew 25, Jesus talks about a man who went away and entrusted his servants with differing amounts of gold to be um, watched after while he was gone. It wasn't gold. Depending on what um, version you read, some call it talents. Um, He gave five talents, uh, an amount of money of some sort, to one servant, one servant, Um, received two talents and one servant received one talent. And then the master went away. And after a very long time, we're told that he came back and he called his servants to account. And to the first, he said, what have you done with my talents? And the, the man replied, well, you gave me five talents and I have earned five more. To that servant, The master said, you've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The second servant came and he said, you know, you gave me two talents and I put it to work and I gained two more. And the master said the exact same thing to him. The last servant came and he said, you know, you're a hard man and I didn't feel like I could do much with what you what, what you gave me. So I just buried it. And to that servant, the master said, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has has, will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God has given us each talents and abilities He's given us differing degrees of means, and he's given us different opportunities. And it's our job to serve in the kingdom faithfully. Serve to whatever degree you can, and serve wherever you're at, your neighborhood, your church, your community, your backyard. If you are not serving, then there's something that's not being done. 
there are neighbors of yours who are not coming to know the Lord, or maybe they're not growing in their faith. There's something at church that isn't being done as well as it could be done because you are not offering your services. Your own family maybe is suffering because you are not stepping up to lead them in devotions and Bible study or to pray for them. In Proverbs 24, 20 verse 4, we're, we're told, if you're too lazy to plow, don't expect a harvest. And in Proverbs 21, verse 25, we read, Despite their desires, the lazy will come to ruin. Their hands refuse to work. Is there anything sadder than thinking about what could have been, but we didn't because of our own inclinations towards laziness or chasing after our own desires or doing what we want instead of serving in God's kingdom? You know, there's a reason that I continue to offer Bible studies, and it's not because I'm such a great person. The reason I continue to teach Bible studies is to force myself to get into the Word to a deeper degree than I otherwise would. I have found a long time ago that if I don't push myself, it's so easy to fill my days with everything but serious Bible study. There's a reason that I always volunteered to teach my children's Sunday school classes and their Bible history classes, and that was because I wasn't always so great at having Bible studies at home. And so it was a means of getting me to teach them and making sure they were learning the truths of God. You know, I had a friend a long time ago who, um, she's, she moved away quite a while ago, and we lost touch. But a long time ago, I had a friend who would tell me, you know, I invite people over to my house like every other week, at least a couple times a month, because it forces me to clean my house. If I don't do that, it's too easy for me to just let my, my house go. I never forgot that. Because at the time, I remember thinking, oh, man, that seems like a lot of work. I mean, I had four young children at the time, and I just thought, oh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea for keeping your house clean. But it was just too much work at the time. And now I get it. I get it. Because we all have to have motivation. We all have to have accountability. Um, Very few people are so self-motivated that they just automatically do these things without being pushed a little. And I love those pushes. I need those pushes. And maybe you do too. Maybe you are waiting to figure out what your role should be. Or maybe, just maybe, you have a dream somewhere in the back of your brain. You've been thinking, man, I would love to teach a Bible study at church, but you just haven't gotten the courage up to ask. Get the courage up. Do it. Have a Bible study with three or four people. You will be shocked at the blessings. You will be shocked at how close you get to each other and how you grow in the Word just by being in the Word with other people who can inspire you, who can show you things that you didn't think of yourself. I can't tell you enough how important it is to just leap. A.W. Tozer said, the complacency of Christians is the scandal of Christianity. And I want to leave you with this. It's a quote by Benjamin E. Mays. And it says, the tragedy of life is not found in failure, but complacency. Not in doing too much, but doing too little. Not in living above your means, but below your capacity. It's not failure, but aiming too low. That is life's greatest tragedy. If we have all been entrusted with talents, abilities, opportunities from God, how very sad if when we stand before him, we say, you know, I didn't do anything with it. I buried it. Instead, 
Let's take whatever we've been given, even if it's five loaves and two fish, and say, you know what, Lord, it sure doesn't look like much, but I'll use what I have, and you bless it accordingly, and whatever happens, well, we'll go with that. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. If you could think of one person who might benefit from this message today, would you consider sharing it with them? And would you take the time to rate and review this podcast? It helps it become more visible to other people and just gets the word out that we're here. Thank you for listening. And for those of you who have been listening for any amount of time, thanks for your support and encouragement through this last year. I really appreciate it.